Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Books and Booze. I know it's been a little while. You know, Christmas is coming. We have our uh, Christmas fundraising live stream on December 2nd coming. So we've been busy, but we squeezed an author in there that we're really, really excited about. So I'm going to pass it off to Don to introduce this week's author. Hi, guys, and welcome back to Books and Booze. Today, we have the lovely Aria Knight. Hi, Aria. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. So I want to know a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? How long you've been writing? Do you have any pets and what are their names? <laughs> um, well, I'm from New York, um, like uh, country-ish New York, not not city. Um, the majority of the state is country-ish, so I'm, I'm from the rest of the state. <laughs> I've been writing pretty much forever. Uh, I remember when I was in sixth grade, I wrote a poem and I got accused of plagiarism. And when I was like, no, like, this is my poem. What are you talking about? My English teacher was like, you need to be a writer because I really thought you stole this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's amazing. Yeah. I was really mad. Like, that was, like I've never been so angry in all my life. Uh, but uh, yeah, I did not steal it. And um, pets, I have a bearded dragon named Shenron. Um, and cool name. I have a <laughs> turtle named Dean Winchester. <laughs> okay, I know Even where cooler. Dean is from. What's the... Uh, Shenron? What is that Shenron from? Shenron is from Dragon Ball and Dragon oh, Ball Z. Right. Uh, the dragon that the wishes come from. Right, right, right. For some reason, I thought you were in the UK with Stephanie Hurst because no. I know you two write. So I thought you two were together, and I was just like, no. okay, if I tell her at this time at night, she's going to be able to be awake because I knew Stephanie had to wake up. She's six hours ahead. And so I was like, oh no, like, are we going to have an issue? Cool. <laughs> Not that far from us, actually. Where are you guys? Uh, Southern Ontario. Oh, okay, cool. Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ca Canada. Yeah, Canada. Very nice. Yeah. We are Canucks. Um, so tell us a little bit about the book you'll be reading for us today. Okay, so um, I know you've read Mind to Bend. This is the, the next book in the series, um, Vow to Sever. Uh, so this is about a... A uh, serial killing billionaire who is basically so inept he can't feed himself. You know he's been he's been <laughs> entire or by his staff his entire life. So he's he's basically a, a giant murdering idiot and um, the nun that got his attention. So it's I don't know it's it's a lot of like really crazy stuff. But I think there's a lot of like poignant messages buried under like the ridiculous drama so <laughs> Sounds yes i read the first one loved it uh, i have the second one on my kindle ready to go for when i get into my dark romances i just got finished all my hockeys and i'm getting into that one <laughs> very nice i love a good hockey romance right just <laughs> so good I don't read romance, so uh, every time we have, like, an author on, it's always, like, an, a new experience for me. Like, I'm oh, she learns in, new things I every things time. All the time. Oh, my God. I love it. It's like a ride. Like, a <laughs> roller coaster. <laughs> I never know what's going to come up because some writers are like, I'm going to read a tame scene because, you know, and other writers are, like, really getting in there. They're like, you said this was explicit, right? It's like, yes. Okay. I'm going to read the dirtiest part of my book. And I'm always like, I have no idea what's coming. <laughs> Start, I'm just going to start at the beginning. Um, I feel like it starts with some drama. And I figure we're, we're better to start than the beginning. True, true. Well, That's I'm going to read true. I'm going to read the drink words um, for uh, for this before we get started. So our <laughs> listeners can play along. So um, the drink words are vows. Uh, Pax Bouchard. Did I pronounce that right? Okay. Pax Bouchard. God, and if you're feeling extra challenged, father. <laughs> if you really want that liver damage, come on up. Uh, listener discretion is advised. Please drink safely. 
I believe I brought that up like like purely as a joke. I I <laughs> word count and there's there's 13 of them. <laughs> That's okay. I'm okay, ready for a challenge. It. Here, here. If you want to be a healthy drinker, get a glass of water. And every time father is said, drink a drink some water in between all the drinks. In between. Prevent I will not. Hangovers. I'm taking the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're good. We're good. I'm drinking beer tonight. <laughs> so nice and light little sips. Nothing hard. Uh, <laughs> mine's rum. So <laughs> I'm good going hard. Done. I'm excited <laughs> to hear what questions you're going to ask <laughs> after. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, uh, we will mute our mic so you don't hear us slurping or giggling <laughs> while you're reading. <laughs> yeah. And you just let us know when you're finished. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Okay. Whew. Chapter one, the funeral of Alexandre Bouchard, Magdalena. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant. The voice of the weathered priest booms through the yard as he prays over the corpse of the most feared man in our city, the man who killed my father. That's highly unlikely, Sister Constance's words carry beyond her intended audience of Sister Mary Catherine and all the way back to Mother Superior. I don't mean to smile, Constance and I are far from friends, but I can't help but agree with her. I shouldn't be glad anyone is dead, but here we are. The crush of starched fabric and a slight breeze surround me as Mother Superior bustles past. She tucks her face close to Constance as she admonishes her so no one can hear the nature of their conversation. Sweat beads on her crinkled brow and I wonder how Constance doesn't gag at the proximity. When I'm the one in trouble, which is often, she makes my humiliation a public spectacle. I'm far past caring about a little unfairness, especially today when the man who killed my papa is dead. My controlled smile breaks out in full when she swats the back of her hand. The favorites don't usually get that treatment, and I have to check myself for all the petty satisfaction I'm drowning in this afternoon. I'll pray for forgiveness later, and I'll hope I mean it by then. But for now, I've won. I'm sorry, Mother Superior, she sniffs and rubs at the reddening mark, but her pride hurts worse than the smack. You have extra chores this week and you're leading teen night. She looks back and forth, making sure no one overheard them. Remember where we are right now. This is our home, our sanctuary, so it shouldn't be unsafe, but a mobster's funeral isn't particularly safe for anyone. Mary Catherine chuckles lightly at her friend's misfortune, not even bothering to hide the ugliness for once. You'll join her, Mother Superior snaps. I keep my mouth shut lest they involve me. Mother Superior returns to her place behind us and my back automatically straightens. She's been in charge of my care since I arrived 10 years ago when I was 14 and we've never had a warm relationship. She doesn't think I'm suited to this life or belong here at all. She wanted me gone the day I turned 18, and if it weren't for Father DeMarco, who took me in to begin with, she would have gotten her way. I still don't know what I did to make her hate me as a scared and homeless teen, but clearly there was something. I've often wondered why the line I'm expected to walk differs from the others, but it really doesn't matter. No amount of obedience has tempered her hatred of me. The two who she actually likes continue murmuring, but much quieter, and I tune them out as the procession slowly but surely moves across the manicured yard. Today is strange and frightening, but ultimately a cause for celebration. My eyes drift to our in-house cemetery, and thoughts of death and my final vows roll around my mind. Will I be able to devote my life to God, die, and be buried here as I wish? With the politics, that's not always a clear answer. Mother Superior can't live forever, but my only real friend is Father DeMarco, and I often worry his favor isn't enough. Who would take her place, and would they make my life worse? The bitter, petty enjoyment settles wrong in my stomach. My head throbs with the buzzing speaker system, and my worries crack apart the veneer of celebration, leaving the truth exposed. It's wrong to feel joyous that a man was murdered by his own son, and I will have to face that murderer. Suddenly, I wish more than anything I'd faked an illness to avoid this funeral. I should have lit a candle for my father in peace. The turned earth fills the air with hints of cloyingly sweet death. Father DeMarco once told me that flowers covered the smell of decay in the days before formaldehyde, and I'm left to wonder why I can smell the body when he's surely embalmed. He must be. I glance at the too bright sun overhead, hoping he's not roasting in his own juices right there. My God, this is awful. I try, but I can't ignore the odor, and from the way Mary Catherine's nose twitches, I'd say she smells it too. 
I'm not sure how the useless petals ever did the job. They're not helping now, and the bouts of lilies, chrysanthemums, and hydrangeas surrounding us only accentuate the wrongness. I might be imagining the rich taste of iron sitting heavy on my tongue, but his blackened blood clouds the air. The church bells chime twice, informing us that one hour has passed since the conclusion of the traditional Catholic, Catholic service. We're close now, close enough that Father DeMarco offers me a controlled, comforting tightening of his lips from his place above me, but I can see the true concern around his eyes. He knows what Alexandre Bouchard did to my father and is nervous about what I might do now. Why everyone here constantly expects the worst of me is something I've prayed on and still haven't come up with any comforting answers. One small, somber step after the other, we finally reach the table beside the dais where a photo of Alexandre Alexandre Bouchard, my father's murderer, sits surrounded by an additional pile of prayer cards. I don't know if it was Alexandre himself who pulled the trigger that night. It likely wasn't, but I know he called the hit. He's the reason I have no family. Finally, Constance mutters, but Mary Catherine shushes her before Mother Superior notices. Pax Bouchard is up there. I hoped he'd get tired by now. Sister Elena's reedy voice pulls me up short. She's the eldest of the sisters and took her vows here nearly 40 years ago. We're not enemies, but she seems unsure of me, which is better than the rest. Nikolai is up there too, another of the sisters answers. He has to be. He's the boss now. I've never spoken to either of Alexandre's sons, but I've seen Pax several times. I watched him, if I'm being perfectly honest. The first few times I followed him around the monastery, I had enough rage burning in my heart that I convinced myself I really meant to kill him. It didn't take long for me to realize that wouldn't be the revenge I'd imagined because Pax was nothing to his father. He despised his youngest son. Pax's reputation is somehow even worse than his father's, crueler, a killer who does it because he enjoys ending lives for fun. My fingers trace the edge of the table and then one of the memorial cards, appreciating the memento rather than thinking about the sinful soft softening of my thoughts. Pax Bouchard is a killer, not my hero. He's the animal his father made and not one who needs shelter. I'm dreading stepping up on that stage and facing the man I've been slightly more than morbidly obsessed with for the past few years, cursing how I'm feeling. But what scares me more is the fact I want to see his victim, the man who killed my father. I lift the card by one edge, pressing it into my finger as I stare down the living image of Alexandre Bouchard. The sharp little prick of the laminated corner centers my spiraling thoughts. You're so small now. How does it feel to be powerless? I tuck the card into my pocket before someone notices my odd behavior. The line of people on the stage moves a bit quicker now, or maybe that's my anxiety as Constance stands on the top step and I shift away from the table and take my place at the bottom. Even in the relative shade cast by the day as the spring sun is bright overhead and beads of sweat spill down my back, it's unseasonably warm, feeling more like the coming summer. This is a performance rather than a funeral, and hungry eyes creep along me as I take another step up. I'm not approaching the gallows, but tell that to my racing heart. There's no bomb beneath my feet, but I can feel the ticking as it counts down toward my doom. Hundreds of people stand on the ground below watching the spectacle. Their eyes pass me over easily. I'm one of the many with the other sisters surrounding me, and it, pro and it provides me a sense of anonymity I cherish. I've never seen so many absurd hats and designer clothes in one place, and the desire to stand out like that mystifies me. It reminds me of the fashion show I watched when mom left me with the neighbor for a week. The people leave a wide berth after paying their last respects. They linger no closer than 20 feet. I search the nervous, whispering faces for a hint of sorrow or a single tear and come up blank. A line of men divide the general crowd in the dais dressed just like the rest of them, but instead of frightened, they look eager. Alexandre's inner circle. Where does their master's death leave them? Constance sinks to her knees before the coffin and Mary Catherine waits directly behind her as I reach the top step. The sun blinds me momentarily and I can't see anything but the colors splashing my closed lids. As they adjust, I see something I wish I never had. What everyone else on the other side already has. Pax opened the lid. I lean around Mary Catherine, but still can't see more than the foot of the coffin, the white satin lining, the lid now propped up when it was closed inside the church. The men don't flinch as Constance sobs. She doesn't bother to cover her tears as she pushes off the kneeling bench and rushes down the stairs on the opposite side. At least someone cried at this funeral. 
a slightly green tinge colors her fair complexion as she joins the sisters who've already said their prayers. There's a sense of welcoming and comfort as they silently converge on her. No one touches, but there's an obvious need to be near one another and an ease in that closeness. Loneliness crushes my heart and I realize my instincts proved correct faster than I imagined. My revenge today is hollow. Mary Catherine kneels before the coffin. The pale blue scarf she prefers peeks out from beneath the black, and her hands shake as she presses them together, but she doesn't hold my attention for long. This is the first time I've gotten a good look at Alexandre. Now I understand why Constance ran off crying. She was one of the naive girls who believed Pax couldn't have possibly murdered his own father, but seeing this removes any remaining doubts about the validity of the rumors. My lips murmur a prayer before my brain catches up with my surroundings. I'm in the presence of true evil. Mary Catherine stands and offers Pax a hurried blessing that catches. Rather than correcting herself, she scurries away. I peel my gaze away from the coffin, finding Father DeMarco standing beside Fathers Campbell and O'Rourke. All three men are watching me, but I barely see them. Standing in the place of pride next to the coffin is the killer, Pax Bouchard. Sinking to my knees, the thick layers of my tunic and scapular bunch uncomfortably beneath me. My lips form the shape of a prayer, but I don't dare utter a sound. Cold chills break out on my overheated skin, and I do everything possible to ignore the paranoid feeling of being watched. It's like someone is savoring my reaction to his work. I've seen Alexandre a few times since the night my father died. The exposure was enough to teach me to control the worst of my rage, but it never truly dampened it. A delighted and repulsed shiver goes through me at Alexandre's unnaturally sculpted face. A little too wide and lumpy, globs of makeup fill the bullet hole between his eyes, and he's covered in foundation to make him appear livelier. It's not working. His skin has a waxy, doll-like quality. He's a creepy marionette rather than a man, and the texture of his freezer-burned skin doesn't match the melted makeup. And that smell? It's so much worse here. How did it feel to die like my papa, Alexandre? Are there bits of shattered bone mixed up in the modeling compound? Why does your son hate you enough to open this coffin? His neat blonde hair sits artfully combed on his ruined forehead. Somewhere around his nose, he looks more normal, though still withered. He's most definitely not embalmed, and the man has been in a refrigerator for days. The crisp black suit is so neat and pristine compared to his destroyed face that it's especially horrifying. I wonder if the garish red pocket silk displayed prominently on his chest is a joke. Did Pax also shoot him in the chest? My prayer ends, but my mouth hangs slack. I stare, learning every detail and storing them away in a dark, fascinating, fascinating place I keep closed off. It's what formed when I watched my father die, and I try to keep all the ugly parts of me stuck in that one box, buried beneath piety, devotion, and grace. But today, its lid hangs open just like this coffin. I know I need to move, but instead I stare at the diamond-encrusted watch affixed to his wrist. A deep and familiar dread fills me, haunting and overpowering. The world is collapsing and my vision goes wonky at the edges, not because I'm going to pass out, but because my consciousness is trying to rip itself away from my brain in its desperation to escape. My spine burns as I force myself through all the emotion and silently beg for help, guidance, anything. Instead, I find Pax watching me. He stands only six feet from where I kneel, less than his six foot four inches. His eyes bore into mine, startlingly green, just like his father's. I hadn't allowed myself a single glance in his direction all day, fearful of my reaction to him. This is worse than I imagined. He's so tall, he towers over the men beside him. He's not overladen with muscle, but broad and strong through his arms and shoulders. Sharp features, curly black hair, and full lips make me ache in forbidden ways. His black suit and red pocket silk match his father's perfectly, and I'm certain Alexandre's chest contains bullets. Sickness grows in my stomach until saliva pools in my mouth, and I think I'm going to vomit. I'm attracted to a murderer wearing matching suits with his dead father. Pax flips through my soul as he stares in search of my deepest secrets, and I'm horrified he may see them. Does he see how little I regret this death? Does he know the sickness is from the shock of the presentation rather than what he's done? He slayed my dragon. His lips quirk ever so slightly around the edges, just enough of a smile to remind me to be afraid, but not enough for anyone else to notice, and heat chases the ice out of my spine. I'm terrified he sees all those things and more. Everyone here knows what Pax is, and the current boss stands beside him rather than condemns him. 
a subtle current of crushing power emanates from the two of them, and my attraction ebbs as my determination flows. I will not give either of us what we want. He's not my hero for taking his own father's life, and he didn't get revenge on my behalf. He's another source of evil to detest as his father's legacy in this world. All false idols fall, Pax. I vow to him silently, and his eyebrows notch up in interest. His slight smile rolls away to reveal the cruelly white flash of his teeth. I give him nothing. Well, that's not true. I smile back, broad and bright. But before I'm too satisfied with myself, my gaze stumbles on something I wasn't meant to see. A line of purple bruises beneath his collar. What an was end. So good. <laughs> I finished my drink. <laughs> yeah, I opened the second one. Oh my god, you're very good at um creating description. Imagery. Yes, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn. Hold on a uh, second. Open my drink. Hold on. I was like I gagging. Was so you're like, he was in his juices, and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, he was, he, so, yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. I loved it's it. a good imagery to evoke when you're talking about a dead body, yes, but, uh. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a real dead. Like, 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 Pax intentionally held this funeral off because it's, it's supposed to be, like, a big show of don't, like, don't fuck with me, but, um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's what I got from it, like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, I got so many questions. Um, <laughs> what made you decide to write dark romance? I'm a creep, I guess. I don't know. Like I, I, I like what I like, and you know, for a long time, like I felt like really guilty about the fact that like I was really into C and C and stuff like that. Like, um, I always like to point out that like. Dubcon and, and non-con don't exist in real life. You know, they're they're entirely it, fiction based, like kink exploration devices. Yeah. They don't exist in real life. Um, but like I've always been into like CNC and shit. And for the longest time, like I really like tried to like feel bad about it and like I don't know, judge myself. And what once I just said fuck it, like dark romance was an obvious choice for me. Yeah, obvious, yes. I, just, I agree. I also write rom com. Um, <laughs> <what>? <laughs> just a little, just sprinkled in there. I write a little rom com. Well, I, I like the jokes and I like the banter. Yeah. <laughs> fair, fair. I, um, I I've been trying to like decide on um, a secondary pen name for rom com okay. going forward. And I have this, like, literally at this point, it's an intrusive thought because I vetoed it 600 times. But my brain keeps saying Aurelia Nightlight. <laughs> I think that's cute. I think it's very rom com -y. It is cute. Yeah. It's I love it. It's too much, though. <laughs> Uh, do do you think you'll ever write? I mean, you you talked like about writing it rom coms. Do you think you'll ever uh, explore genres outside of like romance? Or I have I have like some really high fantasy stories that like I would one day like to try to traditionally publish. Um, that's like a very very long standing goal though. Um, but yeah, I do I do have like one one high fantasy story that I've rewritten like 6,000 times. <laughs> cool. No one ever see it though. <laughs> one day, one day. Hopefully, one day. Yeah, hopefully one day. Um, how long does it usually take you to write a novel? Um, it depends how manic I am. I have ADHD and I operate really well under pressure um so like the more catastrophic things are the more i'm just like yes let's do this um i give myself four months to write to write a novel and how that breaks down is different every single time um i usually spend probably six weeks in editing though i think that's like a pretty like a pretty fair statement is that however long it takes to write i spend about six weeks editing it thereafter yeah, so I give myself four months between projects. That, okay. That's so amazing. 
Yeah, like that's still very, very fast. That's, that's yeah, I'm fast. still on year one. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a workaholic. I do this full time. Not only is this my job, it's my passion. So it's not that hard to make myself work constantly. Um, in fact, I literally laid down on the couch and I opened my current work in progress. And then I was like, oh, it's 857. I'm supposed to be somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> like fuck, I have to go people now. Like real people, not like my my people that I write about, like yeah. the ones I create. No, real people. I was like, oh my god, I I made commitments. I will go put on eyeliner, and I did. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> I'm so happy we were worth taking away from your work for like a little bit. I'm so yeah. happy for. And tomorrow is my birthday, so I'm not allowed to like work at all. Like I'm not even allowed to touch my tablet, but whatever. Like they, they have to keep me entertained, and that's not an easy job. <laughs> <laughs> well, like we said earlier, happy almost birthday. I can't believe you're you're celebrating uh starting the celebration with us, yeah. but uh we I feel so I feel so happy. <laughs> I didn't even know. So I'm 31 this year and I'm very relieved because I feel like 30 was such a catastrophic year for me. It was a decimating, soul crushing year. And I just feel like 31 is like whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I, my 30th birthday, I, like I shaved my head, like bald. Yeah. So, I, like, I, <laughs> I understand. I really checked out the topography. It's not an option for me. I, I <laughs> look like. I've got I've got some good ridges. I think that I would survive like a lot of head injuries really well, but it definitely is not going to look good. <laughs> There's a new TikTok filter that does the whole shaved head, and I did it. Yeah, I look like a baby daddy of like twelve <laughs> kids that got out of prison, and I do my own tattoos. That's what I look like, and so I'm never <laughs> shaving my head. <laughs> Uh, mine was very, I have a very domed shaved head, so I just had to, like, yeah. make sure I had a full face of makeup, and then I looked yeah. okay. You have very nice eyes, though, Jessica. Like, you can do the cat eye really nice. Like, you have a very feminine face, so you can pull off the head. I have I a very <laughs> masculine face. Off. I can't comment because you are, like, half an inch big right now. How do I even? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I don't oh, think you can zoom in. Oh, I love your glasses. Wow. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to grow my hair out though. Yeah. I am really trying. We're getting there. We're getting somewhere anyway. <laughs> but yeah. um what what do you find harder to write? Especially because you're thinking of going and writing fantasy and that kind of stuff, or you have written fantasy that we don't we won't see, so I don't know if it exists. So oh, you gotta release it for me to see. <laughs> I'd probably put it under my act <laughs> name too, rather than a pen name. Oh, and I don't even know what that is. <laughs> my my nom de plume. Hmm. <laughs> so which do you find harder to write? Um, uh, like characters or is it world building? I don't find either difficult to write because my imagination is like too real. Um, these people are too real to me. The world that they're in is too real to me. I can see, I can feel, I can smell what I'm describing to you. My biggest problem is translating what I see in the right order. Um, because when you're building a lot of things, when you're talking about sites and you're talking about smells and you're talking about this world that you exist in, it's really easy to make it really boring and get people like, I don't give a crap about any of this. So to convey what I'm actually seeing and thinking and experiencing and doing it in a light handed enough way that it actually carries you through the story rather than stopping you in the story is definitely the hardest part. Yeah, I, I can see that. Like, that would be hard. Like, you want to be descriptive, but not too descriptive, right? Because then people will just be like, hey, I don't care about, like, the shades of color of the hair when it goes into the light uh, at yeah, certain no, times of day. Like, And I, I'm pretty good at prioritizing what are the important things or what aren't, but I'm not always good at saying them in the right order. And, like, so I, when I'm going through and editing, like, I'll often, like, I'll take one paragraph and I'll be like, okay, I like each of these individual sentences and I'll just split it up and I'll sprinkle it in throughout dialogue and stuff because they're all necessary things to say, but nobody wants to read them all together. Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, no, I, I get it a little bit less real they're they're very they're very pushy and uh, opinion and 
it's yeah just, they take up your time they like, take a lot of my time yeah they talk to you and you don't even want them to they're just like hey listen to me like you need to write this you're like can you go away i'm having dinner like <laughs> <laughs> the one the one thing that i will say is good about it like so by the time I started writing Vow to Sever, I had seen these scenes replay in my head so many times that I was just like, okay, here we go. Because he had been tormenting me for like six months, like literally six months of, oh, you're washing the dishes. Let's do some blood play. Like... <laughs> <laughs> wherever you see bubbles on dishes all of a sudden you're just like yes blood that's it listening, listening. so there's okay so one of my most highlighted lines in here um so uh is it, it's something to the effect of let's see what's wetter your cheeks from those pathetic tears or your needy cunt so <laughs> <laughs> that's intense <laughs> yeah yeah so like there's uh <laughs> so yeah the glistening bubbles definitely okay um uh i'm starting like a soundboard of like things that people say that i'm like man that'd be funny to play you know eventually uh, i think let's do some blood play is gonna be on that <laughs> soundboard because i like just imagine like every once in a while just let's do some blood play <laughs> like, you just said it's so happy like you're like yeah let's do it why not why not so, you're officially gonna be part of our podcast for now <laughs> forever now just randomly sprinkled let's do some blood play i very lovingly call these my telenovelas so there's lots of like cheerful like eviscerations and you know yeah. okay so that is book two in the series. How many are going to be in your series? So there's four main novels and then there's three holiday novellas. And the four main books are, um, so Mind to Bend, uh, Vow to Sever. The next one, which comes out in May, is Dynasty to Destroy. And then the last one after that is Bond to Break. Ooh. And then, um, so the holiday novella, so all of the main novels are connected, like, uh, they're all related to one another. Um, so obviously the first one you read is Shane, and then what I just read to you guys was Pax, and then the next one is Nikolai, and then the one after that, I'm not ready to tell you who it is yet, but it's going to be very, okay. it's going to be very exciting. Nice. And then the holiday novellas are really silly um they're really really silly they're not they're not directly connected like related um the uh the one that i'm doing for christmas is going to be like one of their employees and it's basically um about a mall santa who takes the job because he's stalking the elf and um, so, like so like the series is stolen obsessions. So every single book in the series has these like stalker vibes. Um, but the holiday ones are like ridiculous and kind of funny and over the top. I love it. I can't wait to read that. Um, arc teams. Do you normally have arc teams? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I love my arc readers. Um, I, I've had an arc team since I started, um, which was in, I guess, March of 2022. Yes, that's true. Um, and I've not always been super good on like following up with my arcs and like checking my like reviews and stuff. I've always had a PA for like that kind of stuff. And um, basically, if you want to be on my arc team, like I have like, I, I, open the application all the time if you are in my facebook group and you leave the review and you're like hey i left a review you will get the next book like i am no like there is no militant process to my arcs you're just like you want it you got it just just tell me that you read my books and you got yeah. it please don't pirate and like if you could share that would be awesome and like if you can't it's okay too so like there's no yeah there's no crazy process and i always do arcs yep Oh, that's amazing. I love hearing that. Um, I don't join too many arc teams. I just like, I got so much, like my TBR is already chaotic as is. And yeah. then I'm a mood reader on top of that. So I try to like set it a certain way and it just never works out. So this month it's, it's been, um, 
I did my cowboy era. Mm-hmm. Now I'm doing my hockey era. And then after is my dark romance. And then I don't know if I'm going to sprinkle in some holiday books in there. I I truly like just cannot re- say how much I respect arc readers because I literally could not and and not and not like in a disrespectful way I could not balance and manage my time and make those commitments and follow through for authors and like help with release day blasts like that is not in my in my skill set so like I think that arc readers are just the bomb oh yeah it's a lot of work I used to do it and um And then it got too much because I would apply for all these arcs and not knowing if I would get them. And then I would get them all in the same week. And I'm like, I I can't do it. Like, I can't. I still, like, I'm not, I'm not, like, a super experienced author or anything. So I research and stuff, but I still don't know, like, 100%, like, what's the best day for me to release, you know? So I picked... November 1st I was like whatever November 1st my birthday is the 12th like it feels like a good date it gave me enough time I did not know that I was releasing this book in in the middle of the biggest release of books I've ever seen in my life literally people who have been banging my door down for this book were like I'm so sorry I can't arc read for you I've got like 12 books right now (laughs) And I didn't, I did not give people like, um, a super long window either, because I didn't know if I was going to be able to make the arc at all, which yeah. I did wind up finishing early. And that was great. So I don't blame anybody for not being able to do it because it, it really was a short notice of like, I didn't know I was going to be able to do it. Okay. I have it like who's in, um, yeah, people who really, really wanted it were like, I am so sorry. Like, you, I literally have 13 books in my Kindle right now. And I'm like, that last week of October was yeah. like, bang, 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 yeah. twisted obsession, carnage. It was just like one dark romance after yeah. another. And I was just like, and I, and you're all going in November. I'm sorry. I can't read any of you till November. So I, take, I take your time. That- I said this pre-order like you know like nine months before I had no idea I wasn't like oh what you know what's everybody else doing I was just like oh let me put this pre-order in like no I really released it dead smack in the middle of the craziest week for all arc readers everywhere so sorry for the guys like (laughs) if anybody's listening I apologize I wonder how many other art like authors were also like setting their pre-order, like just setting it all up. They're like, yeah, no, I'll, th- yeah, no. Around this time seems like the perfect day. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot like, of no. dark romance ones wanted it like the last week of October because dark romance, Halloween, they go hand in hand, right? And so I think a lot of authors try to really get that and like market it towards it. You know, yeah. like they try to, like you know, like get that momentum, and um, and then uh, too many cooks in the kitchen. Like there was just so yeah. much going on, and it was like, <laughs> what book do I even read? You all are like, they uh, they all have the same arc team almost. Like everyone that's reading this book is also reading that book, and like I don't know how they found time. I'm like, I can't do it. Y- I was, you're all waiting. I was really, really flattered when I realized like how much overlap I have with Chantel Tessier's team for Carnage because I had so many people like, sorry, Carnage just hit the inbox. <laughs> and I was like, She did it a date early. She was supposed to do it on Halloween Day and she did yeah. it on Devil's Night instead. Yeah, and but I, like still I, I, I I don't blame people, but I was literally sitting there. I was like, I had no idea. Wow. Like, I felt like, I was like, there's so many that we have in common. Yeah. I was on her art team for the sacrifice Mm -hmm. and I knew I didn't want to even try to get on carnage because too many people were on it. And I was like, no. And I tried for sinner um, and I never got it. I don't understand why, but I did get uh, the sacrifice and then I didn't even attempt carnage. I was like, no, I'm just gonna... I'll just wait it out. Yeah, I love I love Chantel. I'm actually waiting on um a special edition of um this why did I say I was gonna say the center. That's not true. It's the ritual. It's a special edition of the yes. ritual from Vegas. Somebody one of my one of my friends got for me and I'm so excited that's gonna be here hopefully Monday. I think Monday. It should be Monday. 
Jessica, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I was like, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Arc teams. <laughs> like, that's like um, advanced reader copy teams. So they get the, before the release, and they get to post the review. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's yeah. exclusive. And it helps authors. Yes. Gives a little bit of social proof. Um, I think, like, a lot of people are like, oh, like, I don't, like, read ARC reviews and stuff like that. And I just don't, like, I don't think that's necessarily true. Like, there are a lot of ARC reviewers who leave, like, really fair, really balanced reviews that, like, you know, don't scream, like, oh, like, I got this ahead of time. So it's just, it's it's really nice to build the social proof ahead of time, which one thing, like, just in general, I like to say is, like, there's, like, a lot of talk about authors kicking off, like, three and four star, like, ARC reviewers and stuff like that. Um, which I don't understand. Like, that, that's crazy that's crazy don't do that not everybody is gonna like every book that you write equally and if somebody leaves you a three star with a really really valid review that allows people to either you know consume your book or not consume your book accordingly like don't be a jerk about that like I understand I personally ask people to withhold three stars for two weeks the reason is just because the algorithm on Amazon like you want to keep it a certain rating for the first two weeks but after after that like please be honest like please tell yeah. your and if an author is making you feel like bad about that or like you shouldn't be able to speak your truth do not donate your time to them do not help them because you are helping them by art reading for them and they should not make you feel badly for your opinion or your valid effort and time so please arc read responsibly and don't let people treat you badly I have so much beef with Amazon, and um, <laughs> I did. Hold on. I know. We okay. beefed with Amazon on a couple episodes because Okay, Amazon. but with, with authors, reviews, and Amazon, I have, okay, so these authors now, because of Amazon, think that you need to have these reviews in order to sell your books because Amazon makes it that way, right? They won't push your book unless you have 50 reviews. And um, they're all four or five stars, right? Now, here's the thing. Amazon is profiting off of that. You need to spend at least $50 in the year before you can review a product. And that includes books. You cannot say that you got an arc from it either. So, like, they're benefiting from this. But you, they got to make sure that the author pushes it in order for them to actually Amazon push it too. Amazon has always benefited. Like, Amazon, remember, started by selling books online. And they'd mm -hmm. always undercut the bu like the bookstores, therefore undercutting the authors to make people buy online. It They started with books. So, what like, them screwing authors ain't a surprise. <laughs> What people what people forget though is that genuinely KDP, which is Amazon's publishing subsidiary, is a mm -hmm. loss is a loss leader for them. They they don't actually profit off of the book. Um, or, you know, when you're talking about when you're talking about the big picture, like, are they in the black on the books? Yeah, they, they are about in the black on the books. They have other departments that are making them exponential amounts of money. Oh yeah. So KDP is something that is regularly on the chopping block. And I think that the only reason that they haven't axed it entirely is because of customer satisfaction. I think people would just be in, in large, absolutely outraged if they were to do that. So they invest the time and the manpower in keeping KDP running. But there's not a huge incentive to make KDP a really smoothly functioning machine because they're not making a whole ton of money on it. They're really not. And and furthermore, the trad books that are bringing them like a substantial amount of money, which indie books are also bringing in a lot of money, but yeah. the trad books are not using KDP necessarily. They they are in the sense that they have back end deals where they have accounts where they're allowed to load, you know, hundreds of these books, but they're not using KDP in the same way that indie authors are to yeah. you know, assign ISBN numbers and do things like that. So there's so much that could be done better and could be done right but the reality is that there's not really motivation for amazon to do those things except in customer satisfaction that's the only reason kdp is still open so if you want changes as a reader you have to write into amazon and what you have to do is you say to them i spent x dollars this year because that's the language they speak they don't speak any mm -hmm. other that's exactly it you tell them I spent X amount of dollars this year and these are the changes that I want to see. And that's the only, only way we're going to see any changes within publishing on Amazon because customer satisfaction is the only reason they even have the department. 
Yep. Preach. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've spoke that about like Amazon, my my beef with Amazon. Um, I I just oh my god, I'm so mad at the fucking what's his name, Bezos. Yeah, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Me and him we got beef, just like how Sonya has beef with um Elon Musk. I have beef with Jeff. Fuck I, that I guy. Beef with anybody who actually legitimately unironically has more than one billion dollars. I just I, I just personally feel that if you unironically have more than one billion dollars, like donate some of it so that you have almost one billion dollars and then you're still super rich. And yes, it may be an arbitrary line, but you don't need a billion dollars. Like I don't care who you are, you don't need a billion dollars. No one's ever earned. A billion dollars. <laughs> right? <laughs> they stole it from somewhere. <laughs> like you like you just don't need a billion dollars. I'm not an I'm not an eat the rich type of person. I'm not like, oh, people can't be rich. I just feel like at a certain point you're a dragon sitting on a pile of gold. Like throw some down the hill or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I eat like, the rich. Yeah, I, I, I want a bar barbecue, barbecue sauce. sauce. On the side. Yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> Salt, pepper, freaking butter it. Throw it in the oven three fifty for an hour. I'm good. Like, but it's I'm funny because my definition of rich is like a billion dollars. But why? Yeah. But why do you have those billion dollars? Like, you can't convince me that you're a good philanthropic humanitarian human being. I don't believe you. Yeah, even yeah. Oprah had to ask poor people for more money to help Hawaii. Oh, fuck He's Oprah. a billionaire. What do you need us for? <laughs> yeah. Put your money where your mouth is. Like, Jesus Christ. One, like, I, I, like, I can give, like, there's a couple of billionaires who have already signed off that they're not giving shit to their kids and all their money is going to charity. Like, I can kind of get behind that. But I say, like, why do it? Like, do it before you die, bro. Like, people need help today. Do it today. But but those ones, I'm like, okay, at least at least your kids who are already freaking rich are not going to get the rest of that money. And there are, like, I don't know, like, 25 of them who've signed off that they're going to do that. But why are there so many billionaires? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> why? No. Why? Because they, they just like to hoard their wealth. I don't know. Like, Capitalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta keep it in the classes, man. Like, you just have to. Yeah. Gotta keep that poor, poor. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, I, I had to buy groceries the other day. Never doing that again. Yeah. Oh I bought pizza today. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to cook. Because, like, I just, my mental health has just been taking a hit, right? So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm not cooking. <laughs> my mental health did not take any better it's of a Saturday. hit once I got That's that. That's all freaking... you need. It's Saturday. I didn't want to cook. <laughs> yeah. So, like, then I got the bill for three medium pizzas with $75. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to get drunk now because fuck yeah. that. Yeah. I, I also got a pizza tonight because I didn't feel like cooking. I was tired, whatever. And I told them that I wanted tomatoes and onions on my pizza. And they didn't put tomatoes and onions on my pizza. And I'm lactose intolerant. And I shouldn't be eating pizza anyway. But if you put any veggies on it, I'll literally die. So I couldn't eat it. I was very sad. Oh, rude. So we need to write a letter. It was so rude. I was so upset. <laughs> so like, rude. <laughs> yeah. Well, so get get uh, ha, write a letter and this then send it to all your art readers. <laughs> yeah. make, make it like a book. <laughs> was willing to hurt herself for you, sirs and Matt. <laughs> yeah. Like my stomach was gonna hurt, and I was gonna do that for you because yeah. look what you did. I was. I was. What advice do you have to give to, like, indie authors or first-time authors, do you think? Well, not to sound like an asshole, but number one, if you can stop writing, do it. Like, like seriously, <laughs> stop writing. What? Like, if it's, if it's something where you're like, oh, I'm going to go get rich and write some books and it's going to be fun because everybody's going to love me. Just stop, bro. Go do something else. Like, go be a party princess for kids' parties or something. I, I don't know. Don't do this. Like, if, if, <laughs> if you don't feel alive while you're writing, if it doesn't fuel your soul, go find something else. Because this is, like, not... Like, 
Bro, I get I get DMs telling me my characters drink piss. So I have a choice of giving people a biology lesson or <laughs> look, just do something else. That's my first just, do just don't, don't join us. We don't want you in our club. No, like I don't want I don't want me. This shit's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't, I don't even want me like what's I don't about? want me bro this is not good no but like first seriously though like if you're not passionate about it it is not a big money market it is not a like super thank filled like like it's great when you find your readers it's wonderful but oh my god like on the daily I just get tagged in comments where people tell me I'm disgusting and stuff like and I'm like Okay, random internet man. Like you have a nice neck. You said number four seven eight two nine five seven six. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, like I don't like I don't care about this stuff at this point. I'm used to it, but it's like it's very intense being in the public eye. Like it's very intense putting yourself out there. So if it's not something you love, like genuinely don't do it. If it's something that you love and you cannot let it go, and you want to play with your imaginary friends for ten hours a day, and the only only way to do that is if people read about them because no one will let you eat for playing with your imaginary friends for 10 hours a day. <laughs> My first advice is do not skimp on the costs of startup. Do not convince yourself that you are capable of making your covers. Do not convince yourself that you do not need an editor. Those things are not true. Unless you are literally a graphic designer and you know how to design book covers. Unless you are literally a book editor and you know how to edit books. Of course, in those circumstances, you know what you're doing. But you, the layman, do not assume that you are capable of doing all of these things alone because you will put out a subpar product. No book should have one set of eyes on it before it goes to publication. And if you don't have the money to put into publishing it, there are low cost cover options. There are low cost editor options and you can do it on a budget, but you have to start establishing that budget and you can't say to readers oh i don't have any money pay for this unedited work and read it that's not fair you're taking advantage of your consumer so if yeah. it's what you love and you really want to do it give it what it's due put a beautiful cover on it edit it and treat it like what it is something worthy of other people's time and attention and if it's not worthy of you putting in that work don't try to make other people pay for it put it online for free and let them read it and there's nothing wrong with that i've read so many stories online for free that i absolutely adored there's nothing wrong with that, that no i agree amazing advice oh my god yeah no most people you know they just give off their one little tidbit but that yeah that's it, it, it's it, it's a lot i mean i i don't i'm not a writer i, I do music so yeah. It's very, very similar. Like, I was even going to say, like, with ARC readers, like, with music, mm -hmm. you put up a secret link, and you send that secret link to people to listen to to write a review before the song comes out. You know? Like, that's... It's a lot... It, it's art, and, and art takes a whole production. It's a whole production. You have to you have to accompany the vocals and the instrumentals and you have to balance the sound and you have to make that sound pleasing to somebody's ear. You hire producers. Yeah. Like, you make exact. album art, you know? Like this is yeah, it's, it's it's art. It's a whole product. You're making a whole product, creating a marketing strategy. It's, it's, you need a, it's team. a lot of work. Like yeah. it, it's yeah. not just individual. You need a team. You need a team. It's impossible for a single person to create a complicated production to the market quality. It's impossible. So don't try to do something that's not possible. No, I think that's excellent advice. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's very real. real. You know what I like about it? It's raw and real. Like, it's not like some fluff, like, just write and it'll come together all on its own. Yeah. No, it's like, no, no, that's not how that's going to work. It's no. going to be hard. You're going to have tears. You're going to puke. You're going to, yeah. like, it's going to be messy, but eventually it will come together and be nice. But it's, you're going to go through the ringer first. 
And, you know, and if you were to ask me, is this worth it? Is this what you want to wake up and do every day? The answer is absolutely. Like, absolutely. This is what I love. This is what I'm passionate about. And at the same time, though, that's exactly why I'm willing to give real advice. Like, I'm in general, I'm just the last person that you come to if you want, like, a yes, ma'am answer. Like, if you want the service, just don't ask me. Because, honestly, most of the time, my brain doesn't even realize that I'm supposed to be nice. I'm just, like, honesty. And then I'm like... Oh wait, let me back that up a little bit. Um, but let me let me put a little like niceness on it. I'll sprinkle like, it on top like, after. But like, like, I actually meant to say was hi. How are you doing today? Like before all that. Like, but <laughs> <laughs> but I I really love what I do, and I think that. The, the thing that is so special about being an author is that there's no such thing as competition. I am not in competition with anyone but myself. And the only person that I can do better or worse than is myself. Readers are voracious. They want to consume. I mean, how many readers out there have read 500 books this year? You're telling me that I'm supposed to keep up with that? I'm one bitty human with one bitty brain. I can't write that many books. How many books do you <laughs> How many books do you read in a lifetime if you read 500 a year? The idea, right? the idea of author scarcity is ridiculous. The idea that you are in competition with other people is ridiculous. If people are not reading, you need to do something to get in front of them more. You need to look at, you know, your advertising, your book cover, your content, your quality. What What is going on if, if people are reading or not? But I promise you, it's not about what the girl next to you is doing. And that's what is so wonderful about this business is that you can literally just endlessly lift each other up, endlessly lift each other up. And you're simultaneously lifting yourself up and the idea of scarcity and the idea of being in competition with other authors is just like silly and stupid and harmful so if you're gonna start writing also remember there is room for all of us to elevate each other like we do not need to have a scarcity mindset yeah i love i i love that so much because, yeah, we need to lift each other up. We need to be everyone's hype man. We do. And especially, like, with a program like Kindle Unlimited. Like, my my books are available in Kindle Unlimited. You pay $14. You can read as many books as you want. Like, why would I be in competition with another girl who's in Kindle Unlimited? Let's tell our readers about each other. And then everybody can read everybody's books. There's no need for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm all out of questions. You have any- I think that's a great way to end this, actually. <laughs> like, that is solid. Yeah, that's solid advice. So, uh, so yeah, so if you're a writer out there, keep that in mind. Make sure you really, really want it. Make sure you build your team. Make sure you put in the time, effort, money, everything that it needs to. It needs yeah. to exist. Just care. Just, just, just absolutely love it from the bottom of your heart and give it everything you have. And if you don't, don't expect other people to love it either. Exactly, Aurelia. Tell us where we can find your books. Okay, so you can find me. It's scrolling right now, up, but AureliaKnight.com. Um, I try to keep it up to date as much as possible, but it gives you information and stuff. Um, I have like more extensive trigger lists that I don't put up because they're just so uh, like super spoilery. All of my big triggers are listed. If you have a specific trigger, reach out to me. I will answer you. I don't like I'm not going to be like, oh, no, like ask me. I will tell you if it's in the book. Like everybody's all the time like, oh, I have no triggers. And that's okay. I have a trigger. I can't do sexual stimulation with loofahs. Like, yes, it's <laughs> yes, it's random. Yup. Yup. Absolutely. <laughs> and you might say, you might say, how the hell would you know that? The answer is Birthday Girl by Penelope Douglas. There is a scene with the loop. Yes. The shower. Oh my God. Yes. That, uh, that is a trigger for me. So I would never think to put that in a book and that's okay. If you have like, if you have a crazy weird trigger, I will never judge you. Ask me, ask me. We're good. Awesome. Okay. That's amazing. That's awesome. And yeah, you can find Aurelia Knight author uh, on all socials and uh, on TikTok, except for TikTok, where you're Aurelia Knight writes. Yeah, because I get banned. Um, so you know, <laughs> let's just let's just hope that my porny smut loving self like lives on Aurelia Knight writes. Because there's don't tag the other ones, okay? There are a lot <laughs> of other ones, and I can't sign into all of them. And then I get tagged, and I feel bad because like I hype everybody like 
if you ever post anything for me on Instagram, TikTok, anywhere, I share it. I repost it. I comment because I am so grateful that you are taking the time to say anything about me. But please don't do it on the TikToks I can't get into. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. We'll have all the links in the description below. Thank you again for coming on. This was so much fun. And like, this was I, a blast. I love the passion. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I had a great time with you guys. So thank you for the early birthday. It's oh my god, in uh, less than two hours, I'm gonna be 31. You know, happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> And uh, we'll be sure to have you back for your next release because that's oh, coming up in uh, May, right? Yes, that would be a lot of fun, definitely. Yeah, so amazing, sweet. perfect. Well, then we'll have that planned. We'll we'll schedule that. That'll be awesome. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Uh, again, you can uh, see the link scrolling if you're watching on YouTube. If you're not, it's in the description wherever you're listening from. Thank you, Aurelia Knight, for coming on and reading for us and answering all of our questions. Thank you, Don, for being such a pillar in the book smut TikTok community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and we'll see you all next time. Bye. Good night. Bye.